Hello everybody. Today I invite you to join me for something very different and rather special. In this video, for the first time in 28 years, we are going to be starting this. My grandfather's motorbike. <laughs> Now, I'm sure you are all just as impatient as I am to get to the meat of this video and find out whether the old Triton will fire up. If you'd like to see that right away, please skip to this section now. But I'd be very grateful if you hung around for a few minutes as I want to tell you the story to date. Let me introduce you to my granddad, Mick. Now, this photo was recently discovered when we were going through my grandmother's house and I genuinely had never seen it before. It shows my grandfather in a picture that was uh, taken a very, very long time ago because here he's far younger than I've ever seen him. I imagine he may have been in his 20s. The story was that he bought this motorbike as a teenager and used it to ride to work as a young man. Unfortunately, he never got the chance to be an old man because he was killed in 1999 at the age of 48. And because I know the internet is full of curious people, just in case you're wondering, no, he was not my biological grandfather, but was the best grandfather anyone could have ever had. And uh, he was killed in a motorbike crash. And again, before you make assumptions about motorbike riders, what happened was he was going down a dual carriageway and an elderly bloke decided that he could pull straight across the road without looking whether anyone was coming. Sadly, Grandad was. And on that day in April 1999, my life and that of many others changed. After that, of course, many things happened and a lot of items of my grandfather's were sadly taken away by various different people. However, a few big bits remained and perhaps the most significant of them all was his motorbike. In case you're not familiar, a Triton is a hybrid, comprised of a Norton chassis and a Triumph engine. It was a fairly popular thing to do back in the day and was a pretty simple conversion because the mechanics weren't all that complex and the idea was that Norton had the best chassis with their famous road holding, this being a slimline dominator, and Triumph had the best engine. The most powerful of them all was the Bonneville, but this doesn't have one of those. This has the considerably more reliable, and to many for that reason more desirable, single carburetor Triumph Tiger engine, a T110, I think. This bike sat in the garage from the day that he died until essentially last year. I know for a fact that nobody has for certain started it since 1999, but I suspect it wasn't started for a few years before that because the MOT on it expired in 1995. It certainly hasn't been on the road since that time. I thought a lot about restoring this bike, trying to ride it and use it. Not many people know, but I actually got my bike license before my car one. However, in the last few years, opportunities to ride bikes have kind of dried up and honestly, I haven't been all that sad about it. But the Triton was forever staring at me from the back of my garage. And in that time, my biggest issue became trying to find somebody that I would trust to do the work. And I was struggling until about a year or two ago, I met Simon, who was at the time an electrician. Previously in the RAF, he's worked for various important companies and told me after he'd done a fabulous job of rewiring my house that he was going to be retiring from that. I was devastated because anybody that's tried to find a decent electrician will know they are very rare things indeed. When I said to him, because he was clearly too young for proper retirement, what he was going to do, he told me his passion was old bikes. And at that moment, a light bulb went off and I thought, ah, here is the man that I would trust to bring Grandad's bike back to life. And the mission brief that I gave him was a very simple one. I want to do essentially what Grandad would have done were he still here. Now, Grandad was a very practical man, an old Suffolk boy, and he didn't really fix anything unless it needed fixing. Anything mechanical that required attention has got it. But in terms of the cosmetics, other than the seat, we have kept this bike more or less exactly as it was when it was pulled out of my garage last year. And that was very, very important to me because what I have here in front of me now is my Grandad's bike. I didn't want Trigger's broom. If I wanted a new Triton, I could have simply built one from scratch, but that didn't interest me. Instead, I wanted to be able to ride 
granddad's bike. And that is what I hope to do later this year. I'm now going to hand you over to Simon, who's going to talk you through the specifics of what we've done, and then we're going to try and fire her up. The first thing that we did, obviously, was get it up on the workbench and uh, have a good look around it to make sure that um, we knew where our starting point was. Um, immediately, the first thing having a look around it was that the, uh, the suspension, the, uh, the fork stanchions were, were very rusty to the point where um, they would break any seals if they were used. Um, also, on the other side, on the bottom leg, there was a piece that was missing on the bottom and I was quite worried about the, the strength and, and the ability to hold the, the spindle. So the first thing that would need to be done was to replace essentially the, the entire outside of the road, road holder forks. Um, easily done, the parts are still very much available. So um, getting those in and, uh, and basically taking the guts out, reworking the outside, putting all the original guts back in and rebuilding it, that was done and that was quite simple. Of course, that gave us the opportunity to change the tires, work on the wheels and change all the bearings as well. Moving back from there, um, obviously wanting to try and keep this as a sympathetic restoration, try and keep as much of the age of the bike in there as possible. Um, I wanted to get it straight the way down to a frame. Uh, so everything came off. Everything came away from the, the engine came away from the frame, all the wheels off, mud guards off, all, all the um, oil, tank, fuel tank, seat, everything. That all came off stripped to right the way back to, to nuts and bolts. And then went through the process of giving it a really good clean. Uh, the idea being that um, once everything was cleaned up properly, uh, to give it a good coat, couple of coats of lacquer and to seal in all of the original age and wear and tear and, and, and natural patina that's happened over its 60 plus years of life. Um, and I think looking at it, that's exactly what we managed to achieve quite successfully. Um, so whilst that was being done, obviously the engine was on the bench. So we had the head off of the engine, um, had a look inside there and it, and it, for its age, it wasn't too bad, but it did need um, new pistons and all associating parts, um, new push rods as well. They were showing signs of wear on the, on the ends. Um, so we had all of those out. Obviously all of the associated seals got changed as part of that process as well. Um, that all got put back together while that was all still on the bench. Um, also a couple of other little bits and bobs that were done to the engine just to clean it up and just to bring it back to life a little bit. Um, whilst that was happening, the seat got sent off to be recovered. And you can see that that's all been done nicely uh, and tried to keep the original colours as it was when it first came into the workshop, which was actually quite a difficult match to come up with. Um, but I think that actually it looks like well, obviously it's brand new, but I think it looks like it's supposed to. I think it matches quite nicely. Um, so that took uh, a little while to be done. Um, and whilst that was away, literally just carried on building up on the parts, changing bearings, like headstock bearings where they were needed. Um, it's had a whole brand new wiring loom as well. And you can actually still buy the Lucas wiring looms, um, both for this engine. Obviously this is a, the T110 engine. Um, and it's not too dissimilar to the Norton um, wiring looms. There's a little bit that you have to do to change parts of it in order to make it fit. Obviously the length of things are slightly different, um, but that's, that's all very easy to do uh, and it can all be made into the original Lucas wiring. So that's been done. Basically gave a, a clean up to the exhaust. These are the original exhaust that uh, James's granddad had on the bike when he first built it. Um, Managed to restore them quite nicely, to be honest. Uh, we found some welding that was already been done by, I think, his granddad, um, and that was all excellent work, so I wasn't worried about touching that. Had a little bit to do up on the headstock on the left-hand exhaust, but that, that was just a, a very small hole that needed to be dealt with, and thankfully there was enough metal there to not burn through, so that was lovely. Um, moving back, obviously, all of the chains and sprockets and, and everything have been changed from primary drive to final drive. So that's all nice and brand new. Um, and literally, as we come back further and further and further, carried on doing the cleaning work and eventually ended up with what you see today. Legitimately, this bike has not run since, well, the 90s. Uh, gonna get my excuses out of the way first in that case. Um, if I do succeed, it is going to be very, very loud. There isn't really much silencing on the intake or the exhaust. I remember this very distinctly from when I was a kid. We lived a few doors down and you could hear it when Granada started it. Um, 
I also haven't kicked a bike over in a very long time. And one of the things we don't know is this little switch here is for the magneto. And there is no label on here to tell us which direction the switch is supposed to be on. I'm not expecting it to kick very quickly or easily. And I have, told, uh, and I have been told by people that know the bike, if I get it wrong, it will kick back. So uh, wish me luck. I don't think it's sophisticated enough to have a side stand cut out. <sighs> God, I'm out of practice. Do you reckon change the switch? Yeah, I can. Yes. Okay, try again. So, as suspected, first go didn't work. We've had a look at the spark plugs and they're dry. So, we think it may simply be that there wasn't any fuel getting through to the cylinders. So, we've put some more in. We didn't want to fill the whole thing up in case there were leaks and the like. So, um, there's fuel in and uh, I'm going to try again. So, the downside of actually doing this stuff for real and not faking it for YouTube is that it doesn't always go to plan. We tried and tried and tried to kick the bike over, but it just refused to start. Under my instructions, Simon hadn't even attempted to start the bike until I was here, and uh, as you can tell, she just refused to cooperate. The problem was traced to an extraordinarily weak spark, which was virtually non-existent. This bike being old, it runs a magneto. The battery essentially is there just for the lights and the horn. According to the chap who rebuilt it, that apparently has never been redone in the past and they only have a life expectancy of about 10 years anyway. As this one is about 60 years old, the fact it was the part that has possibly let us down isn't really much of a surprise. The rest of the electrical system has also now been redone, all of the wires, HT leads, everything is all sorted. Uh, the fuel issue we were also having, it wasn't really delivering much fuel either, and as you need sort of fuel, air and spark, and we were down on two of those. I didn't really stand much of a chance. That was a simple issue, been rectified. Uh, and also, in the interim, Simon has actually worked out which way the kill switch goes. Before, that was a bit of a guessing game. And of course, you wouldn't want to think you're sat there on a bike for half an hour kicking it over when it was actually off anyway. But we now know which way is which. So, once again, here to try and fire Grandad's bike into life. Wish me luck. <laughs> Careful on the road, yeah. Obviously, she's new, yeah. So, try, well, try and find that, that spot, little just a yeah. just a tickle, yeah. Starting that's the bloody same. <laughs> There's three pages in the manual on how to start it when it's cold, when it's hot, when it's Wednesday, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Buzz like a kitten. Superb. Yeah. <laughs> I probably never started that easy years ago. Probably not, but with a good spark. Yeah. I was told it was a bastard. Really? Yeah, 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 probably yeah. Probably because of that, then. It's probably a weakening spark, and it was intermittent as well. I'll call you the necromancer. She Amazing. stops. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, 
Earth's a magneto out, so there's no spark. That's all it does. Fantastic. She sounds lovely. Yeah. Absolutely lovely. Really sweet, isn't she? That's it. She starts. <laughs> she works. And actually, after, after so much effort last time, now all sorted, all good. It's actually starting a lot easier than I thought it would. Everyone who knew the bike back when it was running and Grandad was about told me that it was so difficult to get the thing going. And if you got it wrong, it would bite back. But um, purrs like a kitten. And uh, the next step and the next video, which is going to be in a few months is going to be getting it out on the open road. So the next thing for me is um, I need to go and buy myself a new helmet. Well, thanks everyone for watching and uh, a huge thank you to Simon at Hanger Motorcycles for whom I cannot say enough nice things about. He's dealt with me and I am a difficult customer and uh, yeah, I got my granddad's bike back. Cheers for watching everyone. Bye bye.